in order for Monday, September 10th, board meeting. Stand for the pledge. started for information purposes we're going to be pulling um, amendments J5 6 and 7 so the board can interview the different firms we won't be voting on those this evening and the solicitors report Thank you. Sorry, I don't think that's correct. Uh, Ms. Orr, could you, August 6th, the 13th, we did not have one. August 27th, we had one August 30th, and then this evening. So, does that seem more accurate? It's August 13th, the one that we canceled. Yeah, that was the day of the storm. The storm. Okay, so it's August 6th, August 27th, August 30th, and September 10th. That's my reflection. Okay, I need somebody to um, make an amendment to the agenda, make a motion to add Scranton High School Showcase. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Casey? Yes. Mrs. Cagnetti? Yes. Mr. Duffy? Yes. Ms. Gamort? Yes. Mr. Lush? Yes. Mr. McAndrew? Yes. Mr. Schuster? Yes. Mrs. Dixon? Yes. Data for me. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Welcome. Thank you for having us here this evening. Good evening. So, I know we're only into school a few days here, but we have some exciting news. Um, so, with me tonight um, are two of our 11th grade students, Aliyah Jalil and Priyal Patel, um, and also we have Maggie Martinelli with us, uh, who's from the Scranton Area Foundation. And the exciting news is that last spring, um, our students were offered the opportunity to enroll as college students at Lackawanna uh, College in a program uh, that would allow them to earn their associate's degree um, before graduating from high school. So both Aaliyah and Priyal were um, applied to that program, got accepted to that program. As a matter of fact, Aaliyah, I had to get her excuse from class tonight because um, she was supposed to be in class. But um, So Aaliyah is in the professional studies program and Priel is in the health services program. Uh, and some more exciting news, not only are they full-time students here at Scranton High, but also at Lackawanna College, but Maggie from uh, the Scranton Area Foundation uh, is here to tell us some more exciting news about the scholarships that both of our students won. Uh, thank you, Dr. Curion, the board directors, faculty, staff. Thank you all for allowing us to be here tonight. Um, my name is Maggie Martinelli. I'm the director of administration projects at the Scranton Area Community Foundation. Uh, with 64 years of history in this community, the Scranton Area Found Community Foundation is a public 501c3 foundation of Lackawanna County. Um, I'm in the role of the foundation. I oversee our initiative known as Women in Philanthropy. And Women in Philanthropy engages leaders in our community to create programs and offer support that provide transformational change to women and girls in our area. Uh, we uh, have four different focus areas in what we abbreviate as WIP. And that is health and wellness, entrepreneurship that provides microloans to women who are starting or growing a business, uh, financial confidence and match savings programs, and lastly, the reason for me presenting here tonight are STEAM education programs. 
As many of you are aware, STEAM uh, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math, and over the course of the previous two school years, we have provided support to the Scranton School District through STEAM programming, namely we've brought the Salvadori Center uh, to Scranton. They are a New York City-based organization that provides hands-on project <coughs> learning that specializes in STEAM topics. Additionally, we've held after-school girls' STEAM clubs, so the girls at the three intermediate schools. And as a result of this uh, long-standing you know, relationship with the Scranton School District, uh, the Scranton Area Foundation of Women in Philanthropy is thrilled to partner once again, and we will be providing full scholarships to both of these wonderful candidates here. Um, so we will be paying for their entire courses at Lackawanna College so that they can achieve their associate's degree at no charge to them. Leah Jalil and uh, Priyal Patel were selected by our STEAM Education Advisory Circle for their excellent qualifications. In particular, Aliyah stood out to our committee with her interest in STEM. She wants to actually be a physicist. I didn't even know what that was when I was her age. Um, her excellent service to her community and her glowing recommendations from her math teacher. Um, sim uh, similarly, uh, Priyal's application caught the eye of our selection committee due to her interest in becoming a pharmacist her beautifully written essay, and her community service as well. I will say that it was quite a challenge narrowing it down to these two wonderful candidates because every application that we received was outstanding. Um, and so it should be a testament to both Aliyah and, and Priel for being selected amongst really amazing candidates. So we want to offer our congratulations to them um, and, and wish them luck in this prestigious program. SBA. Yeah, just a few quick notes. There is a school leadership conference October 17th through 19th. I think we all got something in the mail from PSBA for that. Um, today, PSBA sent an email reminding districts that their website, Success Starts Here, is a platform for school districts to submit positive stories. I think the last time I looked up Scranton, it says we did one, um, but I think it's already been a couple years, so maybe that's somewhere. Actually, Rob Noon is in charge of that. He's got a whole list of stories he submits. Uh, whether they post them or not is the thing, but yes, you're right. We did have one about our STEAM yeah. launch. Yeah. yeah. So we're hoping some of them that we submit this year will be accepted. Excellent. And then the last piece, um, just in the spirit of all of the um, hopes that we're laying in Harrisburg for more fair funding, there is um, a case where the Commonwealth Court will hear, I believe this fall, that the Education Law Center and Public Interest Law Center are bringing um, to the representing districts and parents who are challenging the equity of education across the economic spectrum in Pennsylvania. So just yet another piece of the puzzle where um, I hopefully will have more advocacy and more effective advocacy in Harrisburg. And I, I would hope that maybe the board, we could speak um, together maybe with the SFT about planning a lobbying day this fall um, down in Harrisburg. I know there's a lot of noise with the election coming up in November, but maybe we could go down after the election in November as a team. And maybe that's something we could discuss. Thank you. Soccer field presentation. <coughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Tom McLean, the landscape architect with office in the city of Scranton. Uh, I have with me tonight uh, David Balzoni, the business administrator for the city of Scranton, and Representative Mr. Bell from uh, Scranton Shock, Premier Soccer League. Uh, <clears throat> we'll give you a second to pass out. We have some drawings we're passing out here. They're really concepts or sketches. Uh, 
There should be three pages there. Uh, the first one we'll deal with, um, we'll look at the soccer field over where the existing soccer field is located. Also the other side of 7th Avenue. Everybody good? Okay, uh, what we propose to do is to uh, develop a professional level and professional size uh, dimensional soccer field where the current soccer field is now and in the footprint of the current softball field. Uh, also some additional parking there that we think would benefit not only the high school or the soccer field but also some of the LHVA Lackawanna River Trail. Uh, as mentioned, the soccer field will be a professional grade. It will include bleachers and eventually a, uh, um, or a uh, gym, uh, locker room. Thank you. Uh, locker room. In order to, to put this facility in, we need to uh, request the district assist us by moving the current baseball field from that location across the main campus. And that's the other drawing you have in front of you. It shows between Memorial Stadium and the uh, baseball field. Uh, with that change, it will allow us to get a, a broader footprint, about 100 plus 130 cars uh, to service this facility, which could also be used to service things at Mo Memorial Stadium, the high school, and uh, events that we expect will happen at the trailhead, uh, all the nonprofit events, the races, the 5K walks that come out of the Olive Street trailhead there. Um, I have with me uh, Mr. Dave Balzoni, who will talk about uh, the city's interest in this, which uh, from all standpoints is uh, an economic development project, more so in the city's interest than an uh, athletic project. Uh, Dave? Just to give you a little bit of background, this process started about two years ago. We were approached by James Bell, who's the manager of the Electric City Shock. It's a semi-professional soccer team. Some interest in locating a field uh, within the city and uh, a lot of the discussion had to do with locating it within the vicinity of the downtown. So the process that evolved was where can we find a location that we think is beneficial and, and as Tom had noted uh, this isn't just sports related it's economic development related and through a number of these discussions that we had uh, the location that Tom pointed out we thought was ideal now, there are several locations that we're looking at, uh, but because of, certainly because of visibility, uh, because of the benefits that would, uh, would accrue to the school district in having a professional soccer field for use by the, uh, by the school students, we think would certainly be advantageous. The, the momentum that can be sustained relative to economic development along the, the 7th Avenue corridor uh, we think is very beneficial. Certainly there are revenue components that uh, would accrue to the school district as well. So there's a commitment that James has from private sources uh, that would help to fund the project. Uh, we're looking at some of those dollars relative to the assistance in, in maintenance. Uh, plus because this is you know, obviously we know where soccer is going, and we also recognize that because this is a semi-professional team, uh, there are benefits that, that are associated with advertising and other revenues associated with this use. As Tom pointed out, the key in trying to see whether this moves forward, first of all, is whether you're interested, and secondly, because of the difficulties with space, really the only way it could work in that location is the softball field would have to be relocated. Now, uh, in the plans that Tom provided, you know, there's some information relative to where it could be relocated on school district property. We've had some of these discussions already with district personnel. So that would be something you'd have to really decide first. If this is something that you think is feasible, then probably the next step for us is to really drill down into sources and uses. As you can imagine, there's a lot of moving parts. So it's a matter of how can we create sufficient funding sources in order to 
be able to offset the various costs that would be associated with this project. So we, we've looked at the acquisition of turf uh, that was uh, only used for a very short period of time that can be acquired pretty inexpensively. Uh, that obviously would give us a great start to trying to get the project moving along. I guess the reason I'm here is that this would really be a joint project. Um, we think because you can consider this a P2 project, so you've got really two public sources and one private source involved, even though the private source is a nonprofit. Uh, we think it's, it, it's going to be very attractive relative to grant funding. The city has an excellent grant writer on staff. She uh, is more than willing to, uh, to try and move this project along. Uh, the city is trying to look at doing some of the more heavy lifting relative to the finances. Uh, we can certainly get into that discussion a little bit more once we really drill down into the sources and uses. But first part of the project is to really try and determine whether there's a possibility of relocating the softball field. Um, that's something for you to determine. You know, we hope that you have some discussions internally, provide some feedback to us at your earliest convenience. That would then turn Tom loose to be able to uh, put the numbers together so we can have a, a more detailed discussion as to how we'd be able to proceed with it. Uh, Mr. Bolzani, I just have a couple questions. Sure. Um, this looks like an amazing project if it can come to fruition with all parties agreeing. Um, but I just have a couple that deal with the utilization on for the removal of our softball field across the street. When we initially resurfaced our turf at Scranton High School, we came to find out that it was because of overuse. And it looks like by moving the softball field to where the proposed site location would be, it would remove practice time for football athletes and it looks like through Lackawanna and our freshman level teams, it would put them on the turf. Um, I guess this would actually be for whomever uh, would deal with the scheduling, whether it be the athletic directors or the principals or even Mr. Brazil or Mr. Walsh down at the stadium. Will that be impacting that? Do we know? Mr. Brazil's working on that. Okay, so that's being worked on now? <laughs> yes. Mr. Brazil? I think it's all a matter of scheduling. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the area that we're going to be putting the softball field onto. Would that mean that the football players would be allowed to utilize the soccer, the new soccer facility, for practice times? They, they should, and, and or you go back to where uh, years ago where the original practice was at the end of the uh, stadium on the right. Okay, where the shot put area is. or is West and Scranton going to be allowed to utilize it? Uh, 
I think that's up for discussion. Okay. You know, so I mean, it's not, nothing's really set in stone yet, but to answer your previous question, I would say yes. Yeah. Because we're partnering with the school districts. So. Okay, so it's a partner with the district. Yeah, the, the girls okay. and the boys, they would both have access to the field. And then maybe to go back to your previous question about field use, about overuse, yeah. um, if you think about it, the multi-purpose field, which would be the new soccer field, is lined for soccer, field hockey, lacrosse. So you would take two soccer programs, field hockey, off of the, the Memorial Stadium turf. So if need be, that time that's taken away that goes to the new soccer field could be used for practice time. So you're still getting the same amount of use out of the turf on Memorial versus shifting the other sports to the brand new facility. My, my question is, I do see funding sources and partners. What is the, uh, what's the expected cost of this and what's the expected potential cost to the district? Well, again, as I noted before, um, we can talk about the prospective costs and benefits all night, but if there isn't the possibility of creating sufficient space for it, then it's a moot point. Now, I think the first thing the district would want to look at is whether that space can be created sufficiently for the location of the field. If, in fact, that's the case, then certainly we'll get into a more detailed discussion on what costs would be associated uh, with the construction and maintenance and the sources of funding. But it's a little premature to really get into a, a deep dive on what the costs would be um, and the funding sources if we're not sure we could even locate it here. But certainly understand your concerns. Um, but again, we're looking at this as a partnership as well. And uh, we're looking at, at the, uh, the city is taking the lead in trying to uh, create sufficient funding sources in order to make this happen. Um, obviously, uh, you know, maintenance, certainly it's something you'd want to talk about. As I noted before, there are some funding sources that are committed to the project that would accrue to the district, and uh, those funding sources would assist with maintenance. But again, I don't want to be premature in the discussion. We'd have to find out whether this is viable, and we don't know that yet. It is a great project, no question about it. Certainly a lot of benefits associated with it. but. It's got to become a viable project for both on this site. Otherwise, we'd wind up moving on to another site. I don't know if that answers your question, but it doesn't. But it's a good response. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. How about do we do we know a total for the cost of this project for for this site? Yeah. If. if if we look at this thing as uh, in terms of build out, it's over a million dollars. It's about one point three million dollars, uh, and that includes, I believe, the locker facilities here as well. That yeah. the softball field. Yeah, and but you have to realize these are concept level numbers. All we have done in terms of engineering and estimating is what you're looking at here. Uh, it's fairly accurate information for this stage, but what we're asking for, I think, is. Uh, the district to allow the administration to proceed with determining if it's feasible or not. Uh, because I think it's important, as for all the reasons Dave said, but also from, a, from an economic development standpoint, it's extremely important. Uh, when you look at the city of Scranton, you say, like, where is the future at? It's along this river corridor. It's associated with the trail, it's associated with the campus here, with the university's development there, and it goes pretty much from the lace works down to Broadway. So this is one of the front doors to the city. I mean, it's great to see the uh, campus here. It'd be nicer to see the campus developed correctly on the other side. Uh, a lot of land is available, not a lot, but the only remaining land in Scranton is available for commercial development. We'd like to see that have the highest and best use because everybody benefits from that. This is just part of that image, and it could be a great part of that image and have a light on and have a lot more opportunities for different athletic events to happen there. Uh, regional athletic events, uh, these guys do a lot of uh, training and summer camps, things like that for soccer. Uh, so it could have benefits across the whole spectrum. That's why it seems so interesting to the city. Uh, so, but that's the preliminary cost that we have. And yeah, no, uh, yeah I understand everything that you're saying there. I'm we go from there. Looking for the total there. For more and detail. Then, when it comes to the, moving the, the, the softball field, as well as possibly the practice football field, is that included in that 1.3, give or take, or is that 
that's the cost to the district that we're going to take on. Yeah, that, that is just the cost of the new facility, as best we know right okay. now. Thank you. So when you, you guys mentioned that you guys will be <laughs> looking to obtain grants, which would be a huge, obviously, help. It's really the only way it can, yeah. can occur. I mean, there has to be sufficient grant funding in order to offset the cost. I mean, the city's not in a position to be able to write a check out for a project. Uh, but again, given the makeup of the participants, you know, we think there's a uh, just a, a great degree of eligibility in securing grant funding for it. So, you know, I think we're fairly confident that the grant funding would be available to assist. Again, as I noted before, there already are some funding sources that have been set aside to assist with the project. So we have some dollars set aside uh, for the relocation of the, the softball field, if that's something that can occur. So the city already has dollars set aside for that purpose. Um, there are some options within the construction itself. So the fact that we'd be using uh, turf that has been previously used would obviously save on some of the funding. We've already evaluated the turf. The turf is in excellent condition. And we think that would help to save on some of the costs. Maybe double use of facilities. So instead of constructing new locker facilities, uh, if in fact there was the possibility of using existing facilities across the street, that would obviously save a lot. So there are a number of different things we can look at um, to make this financially feasible. And it's more a matter of whether there's a possibility of green lighting it. And if we're able to green light the project, then we'll really sit down and drill down on how can we make this work? And where can we actually secure the funding sources? Um, but we think, again, because of the makeup, because this is really a, a P2 project, we think the state would really look at it pretty favorably in terms of funding. Okay. Do you guys have a timetable as when the next step would take place? And then eventually, obviously, it would like to be done as soon as possible, but... Well... What, what, I've, what I've learned, you know, you know, relative to projects, you know, within my responsibility as a city, everything's a, pro a process. So nothing gets done immediately. Uh, but I think it would be uh, it would be key for us to really be able to start fleshing out the project in some more detail and then draw up a timeline. Um, I'm not sure, James, you had something in mind relative to uh, to a timeline. Um, I'm sure you guys know. I mean, like uh, Mr. Wazzoni just said, everything's a process. Once we get the green light for the removal of the softball field, then we get down into the nitty-gritty with the numbers and the budget, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to take a little time. Uh, and then we have to contact PennDOT as far as the roadways are concerned with the parking. Um, and all that stuff needs permits. So that also takes a little time. But once everything is said and done, to put a turf field in from start to finish when it comes to this kind of multi-purpose field is 60 days. Mm -hmm. Once permits and everything's done. So yeah, you factor in all those other things plus that 60 days. Grant cycles. Grant cycles and things like that. So it, it could take up to a year or more, depending. We're, we're fairly familiar with a lot of the state grants through DCED and through DCNR. Uh, that's the kind of work that we do every day. Um, I think realistically, we're probably looking at uh, at least a two year time frame for this to happen. Uh, the first part of the feasibility, whether it's feasible or not, can happen in a matter of a few months. Once we have that, then, and you know, and the district's willing to go to the next step with that, then we can look at harder numbers for that, and through that process, be applying for grants on an annual cycle as they appear. And then there's all sorts of special opportunities because it is a, an economic development project, community development project for the city and the school district. That opens up more additional funding. So as you secure funding, it becomes much easier to secure additional funding to make it happen. So, and there's all sorts of things available out there that we'd have to look at, public and private. So, realistically, I think two years to get actual turns of dirt in the ground. I mean, that's my opinion. We might be able to move faster, but that's what I think it is. For our next step of feasibility, what's, what's the time frame the school district has to do that before you all start looking elsewhere? Well, I don't think we've defined a timeline, and we certainly haven't looked at the other site closely because we really thought this would be the best location. But obviously, you have to uh, have contingency 
plans and we thought if, if this didn't work, there was another location that we looked at. But I don't think we're going to really investigate that until we really conclude this discussion. I would like to say something. I think it's, this is a great idea also, but I believe it should be zero cost in the district. Now, sustainable. <laughs> sustainable and actually can produce some type of like a revenue stream for us. Well, I, I think that's something that I had mentioned before that there would be some revenue sources accruing to the district. Now, keep in mind, um, this is a project that you could turn around and say, we're just not interested. So, you know, we're here to say that we think this project would be beneficial to the district. Uh, we think there's sufficient revenue that would accrue to the district. Uh, certainly, I think having the ability to, uh, to be able to provide uh, that type of field to the students to be able to play on would be beneficial to the district. But obviously, once we get into the numbers, you're going to really want to look at it more closely as to whether you think the benefit is worth the cost. But, you know, we're not here to tell you this is something you have to do. We're here to say we think this is something that could be beneficial, and if you'd like to do it, we could move it on to the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Dr. Kieran, Superintendent's Day One presentation. Yes. I'm pleased to welcome back our faculty, staff, administrators, and parents to the new school year. Impeccable planning and coordination has gone into preparing for the opening of school, and I commend all of our employees who worked at a feverish pitch over the summer months to ensure that tests were completed for a smooth day one. A successful day one is measured by being as close to 100% ready for meaningful instruction to take place in every school, in every classroom on the first day of school. I visited schools on the first day and can attest that from our bus drivers and crossing guards, to our administrators, teachers, and staff, everyone was ready to welcome back our students for the 2018-19 school year. This year, we welcomed over 10,000 uh, students, including 477 three- and four-year-olds, and saw an influx of students from charters, cybers, and private schools. Day one is truly a team effort in which all administrative teams their staffs, teachers, and administrators put forth a stellar effort to prepare for the new school year. Yet every now and then there are glitches, and this year we had two. Armstrong School was not ready to open on the first day because of air quality issues caused by mold. And a new online registration system was implemented that in the long run will have a significant positive impact on registration, but this year fell short. The good news is both problems have been identified and are being addressed and, and should be resolved, uh, especially in the registration, by our 10-day count. Our Armstrong issue has been resolved and students and teachers will be returning there tomorrow. I'm especially proud of the summer strategic leadership retreat in which our central administrative staff and principals work together to improve instructional leadership skills and engage in meaningful strategic focus area conversations with other education prof professionals. Assignment of our school business partners who work with individual schools to impact our student achievement goal. A program new and entering its fourth year. Work with our funders, which will benefit our students in new and exciting ways. The outpouring of support from community service agencies. The expansion of relationships with local colleges and universities, which you uh, were introduced to one this evening with our Scranton, school to, our Scranton High School students. Our continued work with public finance management 
and the strong relationship forged with the Pennsylvania Department of Education. The preparation behind the scenes that the school district has undertaken to make it possible for parents to entrust their children to us every day is not taken lightly. In fact, it is quite amazing and very impressive. And as you hear from the senior staff about our summer work, I think you will feel the same way. And now each of the senior staff members will come and report to you about the work that they've done this summer in preparation for our day one. We'll start with Ms. Erin Keating. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, to go over some of the things that I worked on uh, with, with everyone this summer, the big thing was last year as part of the budget, you as a board tasked me to put summer school online. I'm happy to report out that we had 542 students um, who participated in the program from both in, in district and out of district, taking 842 courses. We took in $82,000, absolutely no cash transactions, thanks to Mr. Laffey and the system we put in, use like, using um, debit and credit cards and money orders. Um, we do have about $1,400 outstanding in invoices, and we did do $1,000 of in-kind service for migrant education, but moving the program to the online platform gave us a $40,000 surplus roughly at this time. Um, so it was cash positive, or it has been cash negative in, in the past. Um, and again, this is aligned to our strategic focus area one, which is teaching and learning, and also to um, strategic focus area three, systems, processes, and resources. Other things that happened over the summer, very, very proud of the work done in the elementary schools with the summer literacy program, which was in partnership with the United Way, um, who funded that to support struggling readers and at-risk students. Again, we're looking at teaching and learning there, strategy number four. A big thank you to Lisa Berardelli, um, who came through with the money for that. We, uh, we were able to create cyber handbooks this year for teachers and for students. They are available on the district webpage now, and the teachers working the cyber program have those. I'd like to thank the cyber teachers for their input in helping to create those. Those were also uh, reviewed by PFM before final um, work was done and they were put out to the public. And again, we're, work we're still working here with teaching and learning. Uh, we did put new homeschool protocols in place. We do have a number of students who participate in homeschooling and private tutoring. Um, so the, the process that was in place before, before this was moved into uh, the office that falls under me, um, was different, so we realigned it. Again, PFM did review this. This would fall under our systems, processes, and resources. Um, and we also took all of the students who are in homeschool, made sure their letters were um, in by their independent evaluators and everything was documented um, and done. We worked on the master schedule. All of the principals were working on their master schedules over the summer. Um, part of what I do is make sure that we have target dates so that everything is done um, in a timely and accurate manner. Uh, we furthered our partnerships with local agencies and organizations for homeless and foster students. Uh, one of the things that was put in place last year by law is that any foster students has to have a best interest determination meeting to determine the best location for that student to stay in school or to move to a new school. So with the Office of Youth and Family Services, we completed those to have everyone in place for the beginning of the year. We worked with local business and colleges to secure just numerous book bags, and also Jeff Zimmerman will be giving us more. Um, he's our local regional homeless liaison for economically disadvantaged students. Uh, we did get to attend a homeless conference um, for updates and resources to make sure we're in line. And I'm very proud to announce that our district was nominated by Jeff Zimmerman for having an outstanding exemplary homeless liaison. Um, as part of that, I will serve at the state conference on a panel to discuss the things that we've put in place and done with the partnerships that we've worked with in the community. We continue to work with the Wright Center in Scranton Primary to meet the immunization and medical needs of students. Scranton Primary um, is also working to secure dental bags for our elementary students. Uh, we held immunization clinics prior to the start of school. Right here, Wednesday, September 12th, we will be holding another immunization clinic with the Wright Center in Scranton High School so we don't have to exclude students. We're trying to make it as convenient as possible for working parents, and we're able to get it done right here in the confines of the school. I'd like to thank them for working with us like that. We continue to work with the Moses Taylor Foundation to support the school-based health initiative that we have going. 
Um, and again, the district will be represented as the keynote address at the Moses Taylor Foundation Strategic Planning Meeting for School-Based Health, which will take place this Thursday. Um, and then, again, we're in the infancy uh, as we're closing out summer school as it was approved in the 2018 budget to look at winter online credit recovery for this year. Anything? Questions? Concerns? All right. Enjoy. Now, Missy McTiernan, our Chief Academic Officer, will share with you uh, her efforts this summer. Missy? Good evening, everyone. I'm not quite as dynamic as Erin would be, so, um, but I will try. Uh, for curriculum instruction, we have some, uh, the expansion grant for Salvadori program. We're really excited about this. We've had, we're going into our third year in grade seven. Um, grade five, this is our first year. It will be in all of our fifth grades, and it will be a grade nine uh, at West High. Grade seven and grade five are eight-week programs, and grade nine will be a full year. Uh, we're introducing our Safe Dates curriculum into the ninth grade health classes in partnership with the Women's Resource Center on Healthy Relationships. I worked with our seventh grade math teachers on the evaluation tool for the on-track indicator, which is the PA under PA Future Ready Index. We purchased Study Island um, for our seventh grade math as our local assessment using Title IV funds. We, I'm in the process of, we're, we're, I'm forming a partnership with Johnson College and looking at dual enrollment opportunities for our students. That's in the infancy stages, so I will keep you posted on that. Um, I worked with the grade three through five ELA committee members on our fresh reads where we revised our document, our progress monitoring tool. And our second step curriculum, which was purchased with our Moses Taylor Foundation grant and our social workers, uh, we will have four. Um, we have two right now. We need to um, hire an additional two. We will have four for, that will work um, in our elementary levels. One of our main focuses at the elementary level this year is our text-dependent analysis. And again, I worked with our grades three through five to um, our grade three through five curriculum um, committee came up with this PowerPoint, which our principals presented on September 5th to all of our elementary teachers. TDA is 25% of our PSSA testing. Um, our teachers did an awesome job on that and uh, had great reception on, the, on the September 5th. Our middle school related arts curriculum, because of the change in schedule, we're revising all of the, um, there's two fives there, but it should say six, um, all of the our related arts classes and we began work on that and we also met with, a, I met with the Curriculum Council Committee and presented all these new district uh, curriculum initiatives. Federal programs. Um, there's a, there, we did a whole revamp of our federal programs. We, we are moving from NCLB, which is No Child Left Behind, to ESSA, Every Student Says CDAT. A lot of work was done here all summer um, and I have to give a thanks out to PFM who has also helped us uh, we submitted all our federal grants, um, Title I, I, D, II, and IV, updated our title program to reflect the ESSA changes. We now have title building level budgets. We submitted our Safe Schools grant. We will not hear back on whether we received that or not until the end of September. We submitted our ELEC grant. Our ELEC grant um, pays for our school age mothers and fathers program. We prepared Title I handbooks for all elementary principals, completed a, fi a final report for our Safe and Healthy Students grant that previously uh, funded our district social workers. We held principals Title I handbook training, um, including new electronic purchase requisitions, new timesheet guidelines, and new inventory procedures. And again, a lot of this is in um, conjunction with the uh, business office. And we held non-public consultations submitted our Head Start budget in Pelican, and we approved the non-public Title II and Title IV expenditures. Again, our business office and federal programs department created a new electronic purchasing procedure. Uh, we held secretaries training on all of those things that I had listed, listed before on 9-4. Our Title I teacher training on targeted uh, Title I programs was also held on 9-5. The Moses Taylor Foundation grant um, pays for our four district social workers for one year and I'm really really excited about this uh, We received a $60,000 signature day of caring grant from Wells Fargo around uh, Approximately seven years ago when I was at South um, We received this grant. We were able to put that out store outside area where uh, the kids are able to eat That was from the Wells Fargo and again 
they came back to us this year and uh, I believe uh, one of the things that we are trying to put in is the uh, playground for the students. Moving into our ELD department, um, again, we wrote and submitted our English Learner Report, uh, annual data collection for our uh, learner program. We collected and submitted all appropriate artifacts for our Title III desk audit. Wrote and submitted our Title III grant application. We revised our handbook, developed procedures and policies to improve our enrollment identification of ELS. We purchased the Elevation Program using our Title III funds for our data and monitoring of the program. We developed a plan for uh, PD for our ELD workshops for our regular ed teachers. We facilitated <coughs> ELD summer workshops for our ELD teachers. We updated the float list, administered WIDA screener and WAP to all newly enrolled students during the summer. It was approximately uh, over 50 students that came in this summer and we revised our language guide schedules. And just a little update here, here for a reason, which you're all familiar for. This is not new, but we are adding two new schools this year. Um, we are adding Armstrong and Willard. The meals will be uh, distributed bi-weekly on Friday to these five schools. And we'd like to really thank Mike Hauser and all the over 200 volunteers that make this happen for our kids. Any questions? Yes, can we go back to the middle school programming? I know that um, one of the uh, speakers, public speakers on August 27th was talking about instruments in the schools and I was surprised, to, I'm not, I would like to hear about that. I, I didn't think that by cutting down the number of periods that we were no longer going to have instruments at all. Is that something that's... They would have to incorporate that into the general music class. So it's general music that we're offering at the middle schools. But they, we didn't take the instruments away, but they would have to. But there is no longer a band, a strings, or a chorus. Or there's a chorus class, but a band or a strings. That is correct. So there are instruments in the classroom. The instruments that were in the middle school, nobody took the instruments away. They would have to incorporate that into their class. Correct. The they're there, but nobody can use them. Um, and is there anything else from the curriculum committee meeting that the board should know? I know that happened, I think, a week or two ago, but we haven't received any update with what some of the issues what might be. What do you think was going to happen with that? Between the curriculum committee meeting, is there, are there other issues? I know, obviously, with the related arts, that's a big thing, but are there other things that we should be aware of with the changes to the... Uh, Actually, at the curriculum council meeting, I led that meeting, and all of the things that were on this slide were what we talked about. And uh, I don't know if you're some, talking about something particular. There was no issues that came up at that meeting that I, I mean that I can remember. I don't. I don't. I mean, if you have something particular, no, it's, I don't hear anything from anyone until I get to this meeting, and I just hear from different public speakers sometimes about these things. And so, if there were no issues at the committee meeting, then that's great. Just asking if that's yeah. I, I'm 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 trying to think. Honestly, I'm not telling you. I went through my, everything we talked about. The only discussion there was was um, the elevation program, <clears throat> which was under the ELD that we purchased. Um, we we are going to have that for all of the schools, which is the data to monitoring piece. But there's an additional piece, the instructional. Uh, strategy piece that's going to be in the high schools and that was simply because we didn't have enough money to purchase it for all of the districts so we're going to uh, for all of the schools in the district so we're going to pile it in the high schools that was the discussion that took place on that uh, there was some questions about where we were spending our uh, title money which which i addressed on the original slide um, I, I can't think of anything else particularly that came up there was no discussion on the middle school. Um, there was no discussion on the middle school curriculum because I asked for curriculum committee members in June and I received them a week before school started. So I don't know how there would be discussion on that as far as the music question that you asked. So we're just working on that now. We're through quarter one. So you asked for committee members in June and correct. Did not receive I received response. them a week before school started.
Ms. Rose, we're going to do a quarterly update on the middle school, right? I did bring that up at one of our committee meetings so we could monitor the situation with the middle school. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Here's the situation with the Thank middle you. school. It sucks. Thank you, Missy. <laughs> Mr. Janaletsa. <Thank you. laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to, again, the compliance and accountability phase that I have. Uh, mainly, my department is focusing in on strategic focus area three, system processes and resources. We are going through with PSBA and our policy committee, our policies to date, and we're what stage we're at right now, a quick review is uh, with our policies is 21 revisions, two new policies, and zero rescinded at this stage. Our, I, was in, I, have, I have the responsibility of registration, and we are in the process of our first wave of registration was in the summer, July 23rd to August 16th, and we're currently in the evening phase. Yes, we do have a new online program and for registration and I think it's going to be very very good and we struggled with it a little bit and again that's on me uh, I, I feel as though we've got to just build in a little bit more uh, training that we have to do for next year to get everyone completely uh, on board with the online format we did have some technical difficulties and the mad rush at the end with the uh, registrations at the end put us a little behind but we are we are we're getting on track um, right now, as of today, we have 10,300 students enrolled in the Scranton School District, and that's up 166 students from the end of last year. Our boundary exceptions we're still working on. We have uh, decreased uh, from 285 last year to 191 this year. And again, that's for the phase out of the grandfather grades of 4, 5, 11, and 12. And the majority of those boundary exceptions are because of that. Maybe special ed placement and occupational scholarship tax credit program that we have in place. There is a, an annual documents that we are in charge in and I oversee. And these, all these documents are online and available. We did updates to our student parent handbook. We had 11 changes and updates. Our school calendar is two versions are online that are have our, our normal dialogue format and our calendar format. And we have important dates that we have, our quarter dates, our <coughs> progress report and prog in term progress report dates. We have parent conferences and uh, intermediate and at the elementary level. These are all posted online. We have uh, in-service dates. We have 12 of them this year. Intermediate school is the only school that will have all 12. Elementary and high school will have 11. We have five full professional development days and they went off pretty well last week, the first two for the opening days of in-services on Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, we have five one hour faculty meetings that we implemented this year that we're going to have for in services and then we are going to have our achievement testing building plans that we're going to have the elementary for PSSA along with the intermediates and we are going to have Keystone for the intermediate and the high school building plans later in the spring. So since the intermediate does both Keystone and PSSA, they will be having 12 in services and elementary and high school 11. Our course catalog has been updated. That includes APEX and CTC now included. Any other, other tweaks that we had to do as far as our regular core curriculum? Our testing schedule is also, again, these are all online. Our testing schedule is listed on our website that includes everything from the PSSA, PASA, Keystone exam, PSAT, AP testing, and access. 
Achievement and growth. Again, strategic focus area three, system processes and resources. As far as achievement, we're not quite there as far as moving the needle uh, as our, for our proficiency and for uh, advance and proficiency percentages. However, with our growth, I, I think we are doing very, very well. The Scranton School District has improved, grew or maintained in 12 out of 15 areas in our PVAS growth. And those 15 areas are just very quickly grades four, five, six, seven, and eight, math, ELA, both, so that will give us 10, four and eight in science, and the three keystones. As you can see, that we have either maintained or achieved, uh, improved in PSSA math grade four, seven, and eight, PS, PSSA ELA in grades four, five, six, seven, and eight, PSSA science grades four and eight, Keystone uh, Algebra and Literature. Our, our biggest highlight is the Scranton School District ranks 38 out of 638 districts, top 6% in our ELA growth and Algebra. We rank 181 out of 576 districts, so we're in the top 31% for growth with that. Uh, a brief review of our SAT, some uh, statistics there. For Scranton High School, with uh, evidence-based reading and writing, we have an average of 517.18. Math is 509.94. Total SAT average is 1,027.12, increase of 11, over of 11 points. West Scranton High School's evidence-based reading and writing is 518.87. Math is 505 and 45 hundredths which is a total of 1024.32, which is an increase of 19 points or 19 points. And our, SA, our AP score, Scranton High School had 19 tests taken, 25% scored a three or higher. West Scranton High School had nine tests that were taken and a 46% scored a three or a higher. Now again, Scranton High School had 19 tests and we only have a, uh, 11 classes in the curriculum. So there are some students at Scranton High School that took uh, eight AP exams that we actually don't have the class for. For example, like uh, a French, different social studies classes, science classes. So they really, they really did do a good job on that. Our ACT scores, our overall composite increased uh, as our average is 20, our reading is 20.6. That has increased 0.8 uh, uh, points. Math is our composite, our, our math score is 19.9, which is a crease of an eight-tenths of a point. English 19.2, which is an increase of 19, nine-tenths of a point. Our average in science is 20.1, which is an increase of three-tenths. Like I said, our in-services went very well. Uh, I, I thought everyone had a beneficial the first two days of our in-service on uh, Wednesday, Tuesday and Wednesday of last week. In our last meeting, we did have Dr. O'Malley from the University of Scranton who did speak a little bit about this. I just want to talk about, uh, this is would, would focus on our strategic focus area one, teaching and learning. Our coaches that we had an in-service over a little bit over a year ago, we have over 50 coaches. That's a PIAA mandate for coaching principals and first aid that they have to take a course that anyone that has been a coach in existence two or more years the effective date was, deadline was this past June 30th, and I'm pleased to say all our fall coaches have been certified. If a coach has been hired after July 1, 2016, they have a two-year window. So I mean, we, our coaches did really a good job, and I think we are one of the ones that are, as far as statewide, that have all our coaches aboard and certified. That's a state mandate by the PIAA. Um, our, our athletic programs, and I want to thank the board for our junior high programs, were salvaged and saved. Uh, I, I do want to thank you when we did talk, and Mr. Laffey is going to talk about this a little bit more in detail, that our ADs, I want to thank them, and our principals, I want to thank them, that are going to save and shave off, that we're able to save these junior high programs, which is just seventh and eighth grade when we say junior high programs, there are four programs at the intermediate school level, which is 
boys and girls basketball, softball and baseball, that these are the things that we are looking at shaving as far as limited travels, limited sub varsity, play for all sports, equipment needs and only uh, films and statistician visiting score keeper is now on a volunteer basis. And just a brief, back in 2016-17, we just did a quick rough estimate of around what the junior high programs would cost in both, uh, in, in, in the three intermediate schools, which is just around 50,000, just a, a little bit over $50,000. What West Granton High School has been doing as far as saving costs, as for fall sports, for junior high basketball, there's savings of over $1,000. For the winter sports, for junior high boys basketball and freshman basketball, a, a total savings of over $2,000 in the spring sports and junior high baseball, softball, JV baseball, and JV softball, there's a, an accumulation of over $6,000 savings and a miscellaneous for West Scranton High School, a little, little bit over $3,000. For Scranton High School, their fall sports, uh, Mr. Anderson has, has done some cost-cutting measures as far as junior high girls basketball, has trimmed about $2,000, junior high boys basketball, about $2,300, and in the spring sports, junior high baseball, junior high softball, jun JV baseball and JV softball, over $8,000 we have trimmed. Again, these programs are still active, they are still alive, but we just cut back on some of the things that they wanted we needed to save the, at the junior high level. And overall miscellaneous cost of about $3,000 at Scranton High School. The Guidance 339 plan, again, our, our team is working on, which is a, a comprehensive K through 12 guidance plan. Uh, we do have two advisory council meetings per year with uh, the major stakeholders within our community. This is, this is a major part of our ESSA for a future ready uh, PA index for our career standards readiness benchmarks. And we are in, uh, students have to get 20 pieces of evidence. At the elementary level, we are consistent as far as grade three, four, and five, as far as the evidence of Spark Holland and exploring careers at the inter intermediate and high school level. They also have to have uh, 12 remaining pieces of evidence that we will have. Some are going to be uh, activities that they will do in school, out of school, uh, that they will do online, that we will have a file for all students for when we do get, uh, if, they, if we do get audited by the state. We did set up student teachers and observers this year, for, again, for strategic focus area one. For 15 student teachers and observers are in place in the Scranton School District for fall term, 11 student teachers and four observers. And we are, we did complete our 2017-18 uh, over the course of the summer elementary secondary consolidated data collection calendar, which is basically PIMS based. I want to thank Ms. Barrett that helps me pretty much with these. There's, our, there's 113 state reports that are required for submission. That, uh, that they work on endlessly. Uh, right to knows uh, are always popular. So far, 2018, we have uh, 47 to date broken down by the month. And our other end of the year reports that I am responsible for, uh, for strategic focus area three, system processes and resources. Last year, we had 68 homebound cases. Again, this is all has to be reported to the state, we had 19 cases of, of instruction in the home, discipline hearings, we had a grand total of 38 that resulted in the breakdown of Lackawanna, or yeah, Lincoln Jackson Academy, 180 days. We had five students that uh, were disciplined hearing, 90 days, we had four students, 45 day, we had 15 students, and we had 14 students that served a 10 day out of school suspension. Any questions? Mr. the what you just said about the the suspension discipline hearings for that, that's across the entire district. Yes. Is that K through twelve? That um, seems pretty low given our student population. Is that 
accurate that that's well, the what we do is expulsion here. waiver hearings uh, these are offenses that are uh, the severe uh, the severe infractions drug alcohol possession in school property uh, weapon inflicting bodily harm anything of that nature uh, that's yeah, we had we had 38, so I think that's kind of average. This is not the routine, obviously, situation where basic discipline as far as class cuts or disrespectful behavior, that's held within uh, all schools. We'll take care of that within, but we've had 38 district-wide. You think it's pretty average? For I think it's average, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, and then on the sports cuts, am I right that it adds up to about $28,000 saved? Yes, roughly. Uh, Mr. Laffey is going to give a little bit more of a breakdown, but yeah, I mean, our ADs have done a good job, and this is only part way through the year, obviously, uh, that we are looking to do trim as much as we can to, do, you know, with the cutbacks and do what we need to do as far as when we met with our ADs and we just brainstormed and decided how we could cut back a little bit to try to save the junior high program. Thank you, Mr. General. Let's uh, Ms. Baddock. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I have a couple things that I want to go over with you tonight. Uh, we touch upon, you'll see several strategic focus areas uh, in our special education programming. I've highlight, highlighted those areas at the bottom of each of my slides. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention was the success of our extended school year program. Uh, the district serviced 145 students through our program. Uh, Scranton High School served as the, um, the location for the program this year. It proved to be convenient, accessible, and a safe setting. There were relatively no incidents uh, there throughout the um, course of the program. Uh, success was achieved through the collaborative efforts of the special education teachers, um, the PE teachers, related service personnel, the school nurses, paraprofessionals, uh, school, the building principal, transportation providers, and uh, my program supervisors, um, Kathy Opashinsky and Ann Jeanette, really deserve uh, a special mention because they did a tremendous amount of work in uh, getting this program together up and running. So thank you to them and Dennis Engel for his help. Uh, he was there uh, for Monticello most days. As far as um, procedural updates, just a couple things I would like to mention. We. Um, are now conducting litigation team meetings, which is new um, for the district. It may have happened a long time ago, but it hasn't happened in a while, where we bring in the persons uh, who are involved in litigation cases in the hope that we could better discuss and work through the, the I guess, the course of events that led to litigation in the hope of deterring future litigation. Uh, we are also right now in the process of um, implementing our revised child study process. This process has been streamlined and is now being implemented with fidelity across the district, uh, which will hopefully um, allow us to uh, gain better control over the number of students that we're evaluating each year, which could also uh, prove beneficial to the district in terms of litigation, just to make sure that we're not missing anything through the evaluation process. The next thing that we have looked at is the revision of our 504 plan process, which now is a collaborative effort between the special education department and uh, the building principals and their designees. We are also looking to develop a gifted screening process. Uh, I've been working with the gifted teachers to uh, develop a, a more efficient way to screen students and also kind of um, expand the net potentially for, for screening students to see if there are more students out there that would qualify for gifted programming in our school district. Um, we're also looking to develop, um, we've looked at a number of different instruments for annual achievement testing. Uh, we're looking at the best options for a research-based tool uh, or instrument that's able to be um, administered in an efficient manner so that 
it can be done in the classroom. This comes at the recommendation of our uh, legal counsel. Uh, the strategic focus areas uh, related to the slide include teaching and learning and systems, processes, and resources. The next area I'd like to mention is our program enhancements. We're offering a number of professional development opportunities, which again, uh, touch upon our strategic focus area number one, um, specifically looking at professional development. We are going to be offering um, evaluation and screening training um, to the personnel that uh, are responsible for conducting these services. We're also going to be offering a functional behavior analysis training safety care training for staff, CPR and first aid training for staff. We're now going to be conducting monthly team meetings with our psychologists, diagnosticians, speech and language personnel, um, OTs and PTs. Um, we are also having uh, an LEE training that will be conducted uh, in, uh, for the principals so that they can better represent the district in making uh, special education decisions during IEP meetings. And lastly, we are offering an access training to all of our providers so that we can uh, expand and enhance our access billing processes. Additional program enhancements include um, some of our department objectives, which the first one is enhancing collaborative partnerships with the principals, and that speaks specifically to uh, discipline, working with the principals on discipline, the 504's child study, um, just so that we're um, working together to ensure again that we're not missing anything that ends up uh, in litigation. Next, we're looking to update support staff and job descriptions in my department specifically so that we can better optimize how each uh, support staff personnel is being utilized in my department. We're also looking to um, our cyber program. We've um, worked with our legal counsel to make sure that we are compliant with special education regulations. There were some things that we needed to add to um, the IEPs to reflect cyber programming, and we've done that, and we're confident moving forward that we'll continue to enhance the IEPs and, and the programming so that we're meeting the needs of all special education learners. We're also looking at the pre-referral process and developing a procedure, which would be the equivalent of child study, although we won't call it that at the middle school and high school level, it would simply be a pre-referral procedure so that we can get a better uh, grasp on some of the students who are demonstrating behaviors that are concerning at the intermediate and secondary level. So we're, we're working on that and we hope to have that up and running hopefully by next month. We're, again, as I mentioned on the last slide, we're looking to uh, expand our access billing. And lastly, we're exploring right now options for staffing our psychologists. There's a statewide and, and actually a nationwide shortage of psychologists right now in, uh, in the field. So we're, we're working with both our HR department and with uh, some local agencies to see if we can fill two positions that have been vacated. In terms of program enhance, enhancements with Electric City Academy, we did just recently hold an open house event on Thursday, August 30th. Uh, we invited Luzerne, different representatives from Luzerne and Lackawanna County. We're hoping to expand this program and, and grow it out beyond the school district. Uh, we're also looking at, in terms of this program, uh, referral review process, which we have now have in place and we'll, we will be meeting regularly to review referrals. We now have a formal, uh, we have formal contracts for both Lincoln Jackson and for Monticello, uh, which we did not have before to ensure uh, consistent and timely billing for out of school placements. We're also, I'm in the process of negotiating past placements. We're actually pretty much wrapped that up. We just need to finish billing for those. And now we will establish, Mr. Laffey and I, uh, with Dr. Kieran, have established uh, a, a new process that will involve quarterly billing cycles for any out of district placements. Our, we're also looking at our partnership, expanding and enhancing our partnership with SIL, the Center for Independent Living Transition Services. Uh, SIL provides a number of services to our students through programming in the classroom, 
for students at the secondary level and also students who split their day half day either in the academic setting in the high school and then go out into job placement or are spending half their day for the 19 to 21 year olds in Monticello and they're half their day at still receiving uh, transitional support uh, training. The, the last thing I'd like to talk about is, is our public relations campaign, and this uh, ties nicely into strategic focus area number four, which is culture and fostering a school and district environment of trust, communication, collaboration, cooperation, accountability, ethics, and partnership. To that end, we have been working on developing and improving our website, specifically our special education website, uh, web page, I should say, informational brochures, which you have received in the past, um, a shared mission to build relationships and foster trust. Agency outreach, we have met with different agencies. I will continue to do so to just um, make sure that we're all speaking the same language and working together. We held the open house um, at Monticello and Lincoln Jackson. We will continue to do that each year. I would actually like to expand it next year and have an open house for parents. And lastly, um, enhanced accessibility to the members within my department. One of the things which seems like a minor thing but has proven to be important is phone access in the administrative building. So we now have somebody designated to answer the phone in the special education department. That is all I have unless you guys have some questions. I just have one question. You stated that you uh, invited individuals from Lackawanna and Luzerne County. Um, Correct. Uh, in representative districts. Have we received any new interest from districts that, you know, weren't interested until they actually saw the on-site? We have, I, uh, yes, actually, um, I, I was, there are um, several different districts there, um, both in person, and then I did a private tour with a couple districts, and then both intermediate units came, and they were very impressed with the facility. I have to say, the, the just the aesthetics of that building are very impressive, and they were extremely well received, and I have had follow-up calls. We have a number of students, uh, or I'm sorry, about potential students. Right now we have six out of district placements at Monticello. We have one at the Lincoln Jackson, which is the AEDY program. Those students are already in classes. We have um, several more that we are, we're reviewing month, this coming Monday. We have several more that we're reviewing. And now that we have the contracts in place, we're able to get those out to the districts and hopefully fill up all of the um, vacant spots that we can. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Mr. Gaynor? Good evening, everyone. I will be brief because a lot of what I did this summer, you have been briefed all the way through the process. Uh, it was an interesting summer, a very difficult summer but we managed to get through, and we managed to be in pretty good shape for when school opened. Uh, the first is a, just a, a chart to kind of just give you a, a breakdown of the processes that we did as far as with each individual group of, uh, of employees and the, the systems we went through to get people around to get to where we got to furloughs, to bringing people back. This will kind of give you an idea of all the moves that had to be made this summer. We started in March with the 1201s, moving those people around because their dates were July 1st. We, we started in March and April with the teachers because they were August 31st. And we, we, we got to what we got through, what we had to, we kept you abreast along the way. There were, there were many changes of positions in each individual group. Teachers, there were 62 changes. Paris, 10. Maintenance and clericals, 25. We, we were able to call back 57 teachers and put them in positions, permanent positions. We have, uh, we did end up with 16 furloughs, but I am happy to say that of those 16 furloughs, seven have chosen not to take a position back with the district. Nine are working for us. They will be in those permanent subs and long-term sub positions. Uh, we were even able to get one of the maintenance clerical back. We 
we conducted interviews for several different some teaching positions, administrative positions, uh, and we, we did paraprofessional positions. And uh, I just like to I, I, I think I think we kind of did a good job in bringing back and placing as many people as we possibly could. Moving on, uh, some of the other things we did this summer, it, some of it's kind of typical summer stuff. We, we, we had grievances that we were able to settle or, or are still pending, uh, pending more information, more background. We had arbitrations this summer. We have uh, not, uh, not uncommon unemployment compensation hearings each summer because that's when the people apply and that's when the process really kicks in. We had, uh, as you're well aware, policy reviews. We are, I've worked with Mr. Genelez on some, I'm working with the board on others as we move forward in the area of hiring and, and other areas. We are going to keep reviewing those policies and get you whatever information you need, and do whatever we have to. We did set up a rapid response meeting this summer for those people that were furloughed and were looking at pot potential job loss. We brought in, and you were told about this before, we had representatives from PEASERS, we had representatives from student loans, we had representatives from the unemployment agency, we had uh, uh, Kelly Services there, anything, any kind of, we had a, a health care specialist there, any kind of information that would have been helpful to these people, we tried to present them, and I think we, we pulled off a, a successful meeting. We have exit interviews for everyone that retires at the end of the year, resigns, leaves for whatever reasons, we bring those people in, those that we can, those that are willing to come in, we sit with them, we have a meeting with them, explain, their, explain benefits, explain what options are available to them, make sure they have items to turn into the district, that's, that's where we sit and meet with them. Uh, that says bidding process hearings, that was really the furlough hearings. We had, you know, we had several furlough hearings. There was a lot of preparation work that went into those. That took up a lot of time. Workman's compensation hero hearings, same thing. We have, we have people, people out and we, we stay on it, we maintain, we try to keep up to make sure, bring those back that we can, just see where everybody's at. Also, before school starts, meetings with Kelly Services. We've, we've approved approximately, and that, that goes into the next one, certification approvals. We're almost at 50 emergency certification approvals for those people, the district has to approve them, for those people that are gonna be in our classrooms on an emergency certification basis. Level two approvals for teachers that need that. They're, that's a big summer chore. We, we do, we've done a lot of those, and loan forgiveness, it's all a timing thing. Going forward, uh, I know this, this, this was our summer, but today, we're still, we're still looking to streamline processes today. We had a presentation for streamlining uh, online benefits, uh, people that need to make changes or enroll. So we look to have, we're going to look to have that process in place before the end of the year, before the new registration the open period. And that's kind of what I have. Is there any questions? Yeah. Could we go back to the first slide, please? Um, did, I just, did I hear you correctly that of the 16 furlough teachers, nine are working as long-term or permanent subs, and seven chose not to work with yes. the district? Yes. So all 16 had an opportunity to work in some capacity with the district? Yes. <laughs> Yes, there is. Uh, and then, uh, and then, is there a? I see the there's administration is not on here. Or were there any resignations or new hires in the administrative roles? There, there the were. There were two two hires in administration. Westside. Westside Vice Principal. Westside Vice Principal and Nichols Plaza Principal. They were replacing. Replacing. New hires, replacing. Yes. New hires replacing people that had left. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Brazil. Oh. oh God. <laughs>
Good evening. Uh, I, I just I'm going to go through as everyone else did, just recapping what we've done all summer, uh, and, and let you know that it's it's ongoing with our improvements, uh, a number of uh, things that we tried to get in for this summer will be done this fall, uh, and, and on our safety improvement plan and on our three-year capital improvement plan. So uh, I, I have it by building. Uh, uh, and safety, uh, you can see that the front doors and the vestibule uh, are, are going to be installed there, uh, along with new key fobs, uh, additional pens, and, and the AED machines uh, re, re upgraded. Uh, and we've done that throughout the district. Uh, the two gates, which were previously mentioned, they have been installed. Uh, and I believe Mr. Uh, O'Donnell is still uh, in the phase of looking at the, the playground, but we did install those gates uh, uh, for numerous reasons. Uh, John Adams, the safety, the AED machine again, and, and also we uh, did get prices on the sidewalk and do the price. Uh, I did give that to the uh, engineer to put out uh, on a, uh, a quote basis. Uh, there is There are quotes coming out in the paper this week, uh, numerous for the uh, door entrances, we, we thought it best instead of getting three quotes that we uh, we put it out there and hopefully we get more interest and, and a better price uh, advertising and doing a, a sealed bid. Uh, Neil Armstrong, same thing there. The, the front doors, the rear doors, and also the entrances on Clearview. All the doors are original to the building, uh, have been uh, acting up quite a bit in, in the last uh, number of years, and, and we're looking to uh, bring those up upgraded with, with our safety concerns. Also the AED machine there. Uh, George Bancroft, they, they've just been doing the, uh, pretty much clean up for the summer uh, and the AED machines. John F. Kennedy is getting an upgrade from uh, TriGuard on their camera system. There's a number of buildings uh, that are being worked on along with their AED machine. McNichols Plaza, Johnson Control uh, is not finished yet, but there was a complete upgrade to their fire uh, system, which uh, they began immediately upon uh, the end of school. Um, we're also looking at putting controls uh, on the doors, the second set of doors at the entrance, and also a key fob out the back for when the uh, kids go out to the playground. There, somebody has to stand there and let them in this way that the teachers will have access to uh, uh, swipe in and out. We're also looking at uh, an issue with uh, rewiring the building and upgrading it as we've had, we've had some concerns and uh, uh, issues in the past. Robert Morris, uh, Johnson Control has been there replacing zone heaters um, and the AED machine. The engineer has put together a, a spec and that should be part of this uh, advertisement this week for the uh, wall on Boulevard Avenue, whether it be uh, re replacing or repairing. Um, Charles Sumner, the, the rock wall that was removed, the, the new principal's there uh, and, and chose not to have it. It, it was kind of dangerous, so uh, that's, that's an improvement, along with the AED machine. Uh, Whittier School, uh, another uh, school that's going to be seeing a, a camera uh, expansion and an upgrade. Uh, we are adding cameras in most of these, these buildings and the uh, AED machine. Isaac Tripp needed some work on their, their system along with a DVR. Uh, new DVR replacement machine and their AED. Northeast, uh, obviously this is one of the ones that will be advertised this week, the, the front doors and the new vestibule waiting area, uh, and also their AED machine. Um, they're, they're, in addition to the work at, at Northeast, we are painting, I know there was a, a question early on about painting entire stairwells, certain colors, and that was part of the safety plan. We are painting uh, the, the doors themselves on the stairwells to color code them to fall in line with the, the recommendations from the fire department. But you know, with, with only two painters during the summer, it's, it, it'll be ongoing into the fall so that we can make sure that's all, all in place. Uh, we also started installation of bolo sticks at Northeast. 
that too is ongoing. Uh, they were uh, sticks. Uh, I believe we got through uh, grant money uh, with uh, title money from uh, Molly and Dollar. South, uh, we are looking to put an emergency backup generator there. That's our hub for our internet. Uh, it serves most of the district. It seems that the power goes down quite frequently anymore with no backup for, uh, for us. There's a, a little backup, but it's only about 10 minutes. This will give us time to, um, to, to get down there and fix what needs to be fixed and, and not lose uh, any of our data. We're also looking at uh, quotes on the, the dock repair in the back. West Intermediate, the, they are getting a, a 16 camera upgrade uh, with, from TriGuard and their AED machine. Over at West Intermediate, we initially did two uh, stall upgrades for the bathrooms. We ended up doing four or five. Uh, initially, it was through the state uh, because of the showers, and, and they were original to the building. It, it, they look tremendous over there now. Uh, and, and we redid the bathroom shower stalls with new handles and controls uh, as they were original and leaking and, and, and causing uh, all kinds of rust on the, uh, the tile. Also over there, the, the windows out front above the portico, I'm going to say that uh, they're going to be on this bid for replacement uh, this week. And also, I did, I did have a company in, uh, as discussed back in May, on upgrading the pool. A company that uh, actually came out suggested we have a, a professional engineer pool or somebody who specializes in it because of its age and, and possible uh, needs for upgrades in, in the near future. Scranton High, uh, this whole building is uh, in the process. They're not quite done yet. I'm, I'm hoping within the next two weeks, their camera upgrade and expansion will be complete along with their AED machine. We did replace the floor uh, in the hallway going out to the, uh, the, the loading dock, which was uh, in dire need of it. And along with this, uh, this building with the pool, there were upgrades that this company recommended. Uh, one would be changing the, the, the chemicals that we use to a safer, safer uh, chemical and, and how we uh, add it to our, our, our pool. Uh, West Side AED machine and, and other uh, electrical work in the auditorium and repairs of uh, the, the principal's office over there. Sorry if I'm not keeping up there. District-wide, we've been working with the, the title program manager to secure the grants. As I said, the polo, stick, polo sticks and two-way radios. Uh, we've been doing a tremendous amount of plumbing repairs. We did purchase a machine that, that is produced by Clorox uh, that uh, aids us in, in the control of uh, mold and or any other uh, outbreak of flu or anything like that. So. Uh, we are also looking at safety issues and installation of a door on the third floor of the administration building with a swipe card so to uh, limit the access uh, to, to that floor. Now, these next, these next couple pages are part of the ESCO. Uh, this, this should be rounded out in the next month. Uh, if, if you look at them all, it affected all of our buildings, the stadium, the administration building, obviously the, the we have uh, warranties and savings on the electrical uh, or labor costs and the controls uh, throughout throughout the district. The window replacement, uh, if, you, if you notice the ones in the app building or any other schools, they, they, they really make a difference. Uh, we are looking at uh, two schools that did not come with screens. Screens were not part because they are not a savings. So we, are, we did reach out to the company to try and uh, see what we can do about getting screens. I, I believe it's um, Willard and, and uh, Prescott. Uh, indoor air quality, we had duct work done at, at West Intermediate, Kennedy and McNichols. We are looking to go forward and possibly do some additional duct, uh, duct cleaning and, and duct work throughout the district. Uh, just about every building had some type of energy conservation whether it be two, uh, new urinals, new faucets, or uh, aerators to uh, cut down on, on waste. Same thing along with our steam fitting, uh, a cooler. Our, 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 all of our steam traps 
were retrofitted. Uh, in addition, we, we did replace two uh, systems, West Intermediate and McNichols Plaza, with gas, hot water, heaters, and boilers. They were fully electric previous, and we changed out uh, South Scranton uh, School to a, a new uh, furnaces for higher efficiency uh, burn. <coughs> Uh, information technology, the, dist the district is in the process of a, a, a district-wide transition to an internet phone system. That, that started months ago. Uh, transportation, TransFinder uh, has been going. Uh, we, we've been having meetings. Uh, we're supposed to have a meeting, I believe, next week to see what the, uh, uh, you know, to, to challenge and see where we're at with that and if it's actually a better system than, than we were seeing before. In our asset management, uh, we did have our IT department go through hundreds and hundreds of pieces of equipment, and, and uh, we brought in a company uh, out of Harrisburg, which uh, was used in other districts to recycle those. Uh, you know, there's stuff that's 20, 30 years old that, that is just laying around. Um, also, we, we try and uh, the record management in the ad building, second floor, we try and keep up to date on that and, and make sure that everything is uh, in, in conjunction with what our, our documents are supposed to be. I, I have just two, two notes. Uh, we are in line with our, our safety coordinator events. The, the first step was appointing a, a safety coordinator by the end of um, August. The next step would be uh, the, the state committee is going to develop surveys uh, and, and provide them, and we'll have to do it district-wide. One thing I will note is that part of their, their requirement is to have site assessments done. Now, we had a couple done uh, by the Scranton police. And, and for those of you who were here, uh, Corporal Harris, he's no longer there. They do not have anybody now. So it's going to be incumbent upon us to put out a bid or an RFQ or uh, contact somebody who can provide those to us. They are part of the requirement for the Act 44 uh, and the safety, safety coordinator's position. Um, I just want to mention two other things. We are in the process uh, on busing. We talk about transportation, color coding, uh, whether it be wristbands for backpacks or kids, uh, the first, second, third, fourth grade, anybody on the bus. So it makes it easier uh, for the bus drivers to know that those kids are supposed to be there and it makes it easy for us to track them. Hopefully we can get that up and running in the next few weeks. And on a one last note, uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, this Sunday coming up, Sunday, uh, September 16th at noon, the uh, flag raising ceremony is going to be down in front of uh, Memorial Stadium for the new Veterans Memorial uh, uh, Park there. So I. I'm not sure if you got emails, but everybody's invited, and it's going to be a it's going to be a nice thing. If you've seen it lately, it's, it really came together, and that's their first phase of uh, this this memorial. Their second phase is going to be stones with the names etched of all the, the Scranton veterans. So, anybody have any questions? Just I just have one. All the work being done in the Whittier complex—that's the building we own. We're not touching the Catholic diocese building <coughs> nativity. No. Okay. That's all I had. Oh, yeah. Um, I was looking back at the district-wide piece about working with um, a title program manager to secure grants for Bolo Sticks and two-way radios. This would be a question for you, Mr. Brazil, and working in concert with Mr. Laffey. Um, you know, we, we did get money for capital improvements. Would there be a way to potentially purchase those now to have them in the schools? If we could get grant money in the future, then have that those funds go back in the capital improvements funds retroactively to purchase the bolo sticks and yeah. i have the bolo sticks i, I we, we, we bought 424 of them we have them okay we we do have those our our our, our objective was to do northeast and in west granton they were everyone's concerned that we can if we want to roll it in other ones we we will oh, okay. but we have those great Thank you, Mr. Brazil. I've had a request to ask the audience, whoever is streaming Monday Night Football, to turn off the sound. We can hear it up here. Is it out in the hallway?
you get a score or two? Was <laughs> <laughs> it you, Mr. Lassie? It wasn't me. I'm an Eagles fan. I watched Thursday night. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll just be brief. I just have a few uh, points that we wanted to go over. Um, just some of the areas that we've worked on in the business office. Obviously, the bullet point number one you're very familiar with was the preparation and adoption of our 2019 preliminary budget. Uh, we still have a lot of work ahead of us to do. However, uh, I think it sets us on a good timeline. It, as you know, it allows the district to consider raising your tax rate, tax millage above the Act 1 index, which for this year is set at 3.6%. Uh, once that was adopted by the board, my next step was to apply to PDE to determine what the uh, allowable exceptions would be. That was submitted on time of August 28th, and we're waiting uh, final word on that now. So once approval is uh, received, I'll be communicating that to the board. Um, at the request of the board, we also bid, put out many professional service uh, RFQs for the summer, which uh, were, were received on August 28th. Um, one of them being the district medical service, which was awarded prior uh, to uh, to this meeting, architectural and engineering services, the three labor, the three legal councils, and our salary, salary reduction benefits administration, which have all been shared with you. Um, the next piece, which was something that the, uh, we took on, was a a copier consultant was brought in to review the needs of the district, of printing and copying needs. Uh, the bid specs have been prepared and are due back on September 28th. Uh, we, we will have a uh, pre-bid meeting this week with any uh, interested um, vendors. And you know the goal of this is obviously to save uh, district dollars but also right size the fleet and, and the needs of our printing and copying needs. As a few other people have mentioned, we focused a lot on training in, in our office. Specifically, we use a software called CSIU. Uh, one of the areas that I really wanted to get into was our they have a budget preparation module. It's going to allow me a little bit more uh, information when preparing salary schedules for the 2019 budget. So I'll be happy to report to the board, you know, and be able to provide like, detailed salary schedules, system generated, uh, for your for your review of any programs or. Uh, uh, Offices that we may have, um, as Missy noted, we had the we are rolling out the POs for the federal programs, with uh, the intent to go district wide once you know we uh, get through this pilot program. I think that should really streamline some of the operations. The timing of the processing of POs it will take away the need to kind of uh, dual entry. It will be all in one system and run run a little smoother. And as uh, Ms. Baddock mentioned, you know, with some of the out-of-district tuition, we will be utilizing our accounts receivable uh, systems as well to properly recognize the tuition revenues and the periods that they're incurred and be able to track any outstanding or aging AR. Uh, one of the other areas that we worked on was, our, was the state and federal reporting um, that's necessary. A lot of that reporting is what allows us to receive some of the budgeted state and federal revenues that we have. Uh, we've completed many ca quarterly cash on hand reports, which are necessary for our Title I, Title I Part D, Title II, Title III, Title IV, Title IV, and Project Elect funding. So they've all been uh, submitted, received, accepted, and our funding will continue as budgeted. Uh, we've also completed our quarterly drawdown reports for some Department of Ed grants that we have. Uh, our Act 29 Social Security reimbursement report is a, is a, is a is a state funding source of about $3.6 million, again, submitted quarterly, but that will continue to uh, have those revenues received to the district. Completed some PD reports related to juveniles incarcerated and also the uh, charter and cyber school tuition. And we are currently working on our application for our IDEA reimbursement, which will be submitted to the NEIU very shortly. Some of the day-to-day -day operations, uh, you know, we continue to uh, you know, move along in, in the office. Our payroll department, you know, was, uh, you know, over the summer processed five bi-weekly payrolls, including our, you know, very large bulk pay. Um, the accounts payable department processed over nine board or exception bill reports, which would include the reports tonight for your consideration for your approval. Uh, purchase orders were reviewed, prepared, and uh, sent out to prepare for the opening of school. Your monthly treasurer's reports were prepared uh, and sent to the board for your approval and review. Uh, 
Uh, our, all of our quarterly tax reports were submitted on time. Bank reconciliations are complete. Uh, as Ms. McTiernan noted, building budgets. One of, the, uh, one of the steps we need to do to align with some of the ESSA requirements is prepare building budgets on a federal level so that each elementary school knows what their Title I allocations are. That's something that we are, we've begun and probably putting the final touches on tomorrow. And we've continued to work with uh, PFM in providing technical assistance to the district. Um, kind of outside of the budget and finance area, but our food service program uh, kicked off a summer food service program on June 20th, which wrapped up just a few days ago on August 29th. We served approximately 27,000 meals to school-age students, all free of charge, which would include any breakfast, lunch, or snacks at various sites throughout the city. And we've also, with the help of Aramark, we applied for and received approval for all our elementary schools to receive the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program three days a week, which will commence on October 1st. Uh, this allows our students to sample the, these uh, fresh fruits at, at no cost to the district or to the students. So that's probably, the, I think, the third year we've had all, all districts uh, participating in that program. That's all I have for this evening. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Lefty. Thank you. I, I just had one question, Mr. Lefty. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was waiting to see if anybody else had anything. So uh, we put out professional service uh, RFQs um, that we are on a timeline. <coughs> With Salary Reduction Benefits Administrator, um, we just got word that we would be saving money with that uh, by putting that out. Could you explain that a little bit? Certainly, yeah. There was uh, one, per, uh, so what that is, is that's the administration of our 403B and 457 plans for the district. Um, the vendor that responded, uh, and that's presented for your consideration tonight, responded at a, as a no cost uh, bid to, to the district or to the employees of the Strain School District. So um, it is a service that we've paid for in the past. You know, they act as a pass through to the investment companies. And um, the, the response that we received was, was no cost. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Laffey. Thank you, Mrs. Dixon. We appreciate being able to update the board on what we're doing and what we'll continue to do, and we'll continue to update you as we move along. Thanks, Thank you, Dr. Curian, and, and all the senior staff. On behalf of the board, it was very helpful. Uh, and Dr. Crane, on the six million dollars from the state, could you just give us an update on when you'll be meeting with the state to discuss those parameters? Uh, I have an initial meeting this week uh, with PFM to begin discussions on how we will approach that. We don't have a date yet for uh, the meeting on what we will actually. Uh, do and how it will be implemented. As soon as I know, I will be sure the board is aware. Anyone else? Okay, we're moving on to the public comment part of our agenda during this time. Public comment speakers are welcome to speak on agenda and non-agenda items. The board will listen and not respond to any speakers. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person and each person has one opportunity at the microphone, regardless of minutes used, and, and any unused minutes not be, may not be passed to another speaker, with the exception of un, union and government officials who get four minutes. Board secretary will time the comments and alert the chair when time has expired, and then we will let you know that your time has expired and you'll be allowed to finish your sentence. Um, please refrain from using any derogatory comments or calling anyone names. Our first speaker this evening is Mr. Pat Vesta. Yay, Pat. Come on, Pat. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Patrick Vesta. I'm a grade three teacher at Dickles Plaza Elementary School and the second vice president of the Scranton Federation of Teachers, Local 1147. Tonight, as we embark on another school year, I cannot help but put the last three years in perspective as a teacher in this district that I love. I am desperately trying 
not only to frame the current situation the district finds itself in, but the overall educational direction this district is heading in. During the current tenure of this senior administrative team led by Dr. Kirian, the district endured, in my opinion, going back in time, an unnecessary 11-day work stoppage. Put forth, going back in time, elementary school program proposals that would have severely curtailed access to related arts classes and caused bedlam. We have reduced graduation requirements. We have enacted a costly, ill-fated special education plan that you were warned would cost millions and did. This administration has waged a constant attack on the collective bargaining agreement negotiated in good faith among two parties, as evidenced by the record number of grievances and arbitrations filed and argued. We have a severe shortage of substitute teachers that render preparation periods a mere possibility of having instead of a guarantee, and on and on. All while the teaching staff has worked without a contract for over a year now, despite, factually, moving far from our original contract proposals and as a union agreeing unanimously to accept an independent fact finder's report that was modest at best. Let's talk about currently. Currently, we have endured the burden of a financial meltdown with further program cuts especially to related arts, furloughs of needed staff, schedules that we feel are both unsafe and unrealistic, and as heartbreaking as it is every time I say this, elimination of a library program in the year 2018, and no related arts anymore in our landmark, or what used to be our landmark preschool program. While we agree on the need for more equitable state funding to Scranton, I have a feeling we might disagree on the use of the $6 million grant recently awarded by Harrisburg. This, on top of the $2 million already received by Harrisburg. On the Scranton School District website, it states the money will be used to enhance literacy, mathematics, STEAM training, and so on. The hypocrisy in that statement on your website, in the light of the above cuts I just mentioned, is absolutely stunning to me at a minimum. But to achieve those goals, let us put forth some of our ideas, what to do with the money. Number one, ensure a teacher contract for your staff that values us in approval. Yes. Number two, when you talk about literacy and you don't have libraries, I cannot get over that. Number two, restore library science immediately. Restore related arts classes to ensure equal opportunity for our students that we teach in Scranton. Bring back graduation requirements cut. And number five, and really kind of important, restore morale and integrity in our schools. I will say this, because I have spoken in front of the board and I have said this before. Not doing so on your part will be evidence enough that the consistent pattern of the regressive educational ideas that this senior administrative leadership team has espoused has always been the goal. Not only regressive, but severely chaotic, as we are now witnessing, as a case in point, physical education trained teachers being asked to fill vacant special education positions with the burden of going back to school to get a degree or Excuse ELL me, Mr. Positions, Festa. or history positions. Excuse me, Mr. Festa, the, the buzzer rings. Can you finish up? I can. Thank you. Is my time up? Yeah, I didn't oh, hear I, it I, either. I, I didn't hear the bell. I didn't either. Thank One you more so thing. Much. Chaotic. The most consistent word that many of my colleagues and I can think of to describe the past three years, and we feel the current impending one as well. I will finish with this. This board was wrong, in my opinion, to accept the furlough list discrepancies and all.
but it's time that this board finally stand up and choose to do right and please halt the ever speeding chaotic course we have had to endure over this current administrative tenure. And please write the course that was set out for this district three years ago. It's long past due to replace words like eliminate, curtail, cut, reduce with words like restore, progress, sustain, add, and respect. Thank you very much. Yay, Pat! Thank you, Mr. Fessy. Mrs. Mrs. Orr, can, is the, can we get that to go louder? I didn't even hear that. For you. That okay. My phone went off, but that, I didn't. When the bill goes off, we have to wrap it up. Ms. Boland? I don't know what more I could say that Pat didn't say, but I'll give it a shot. Um, I noticed the pain upon your faces tonight sitting here for the past two hours, plus listening to the preparation for day one of school. And um, I'm sure that Charles Corral was right all those years ago when he said education has its own language. And I'm sure those of you not involved in education need a dictionary to understand most of what you were told tonight. So congratulations, at least you sat still. Most of you, I did notice you had to get up and leave the room, and I'm glad that you did that because that's what the teachers cannot do. They can't go to the bathroom during the course of their work day because of the schedules that were put together that has them teaching classes back to back to back to back to back, and if a class ends at 10, the next class starts at 10. It's amazing to do that. Scientifically, it's impossible, but that's the schedule. Um, we heard a couple of things tonight that I would like to clarify. Let's talk about committees. Let's talk about committees. When asked for a committee, the union gives the district the names of people to serve on the committees. This summer, I was questioned a couple of times from Mrs. McTiernan and Dr. Kerian. Dr. Kerian sent me an email. I responded that we would get to it as soon as we had the names to give to the district. Now, why didn't I do that overnight? Because that's usually the procedure. Because I don't know where the teachers are yet. You just heard that you have special education classes being taught by teachers who last year taught physical education. They're not certified yet and I can't put them on a committee to write special education curricula if they're not trained in that. We had teachers switch from one department to another, from secondary to elementary, from elementary to middle. People are everywhere. They're not teaching necessarily what they taught last year. I cannot put people on a committee when they haven't taught the subject. Logical, isn't it? Pretty simple. So I gave Mr. Gaynor time because I knew what he was trying to do all summer. And finally one day I said to him, you've got to give me some kind of a list because Mrs. McTiernan wants a list. And I can't give her the list without the list. So Mr. Gaynor was very kind, supplied me with the list, and 24 hours later we sent the names in. And she was correct tonight, Mrs. McTiernan was, to tell you it was just close to the beginning of school because that's when I got the list. And I have to give Mr. Gaynor credit because I know that list is still not correct. We're still working on it. There's been a lot of damage done to this district over the last couple of months. Severe damage that I don't know if you'll be able to correct. I'm sure you're not gonna get the personnel back here that you desperately, desperately need. You cut the languages, you've cut, cut to infinity and beyond, and you will not get them back. You're short-staffed right now. The line at this school, day one, was out the door and around the corner here. I was here, I didn't see it. Well, I have pictures of it so I can prove it. I was there too. Anybody work here? The line went from the guidance all the way down the hall. That happened both days, the first two days. 
That's, that's just what happens. Why? Because you're short-staffed in the guidance department here. You're short-staffed in the guidance department at West. Why? Mr. Gator to give them the money if they could come. You're not getting anybody. Uh, Jeff talked about screens. There are screens over at John Adams School that have been out of those windows for three years now. So why aren't they put back in? Maybe because we want the kids to get bug bites? I don't know. You got me. Doesn't make sense to me. I take the screens in and out of the windows of my house, I put them back. Wash them, put them back. You want to know what happened in school day one? Calamity, that's what. I invited all of you to go to the schools and see for yourselves. Why didn't you try it? The teachers should have loved your help, even if you just stood there while they went to the bathroom. A life activity, you know. And we can't get to the bathroom because there's no coverage. And now the middle school teachers, when they do get a prep, if and when they ever get a prep, that prep will be taken up by them going to someplace else to cover a different class. Why? Because it's no duty periods. Which is when the principal got to use the teacher to cover a class. No, that can't happen. So, you know what uh, the laws of motion are? You know that third law, that for every action there's an opposite and equal reaction? Well, the laws of motion are in place right now. And God help us all, because it's not going to be fun. Just like a second grader being found in a seventh grade class isn't fun. No. But you want to learn the truth about the first week of school? There's people behind me that can tell you the truth. They won't do a PowerPoint for you, but they can tell you the truth about what goes on, because they're living it. And you shouldn't be afraid of the truth. You shouldn't. But maybe you are. I suggest strongly that you get in touch with your employees who are sitting behind me and elsewhere in this district to tell you how they're dealing with the 10,000 plus students of the Scranton School District that is continuing to grow as we sit here tonight. And you cut staff. And now we can't get staff. So for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. And you're about to be, be the beneficiaries of all that just occurred. You took bad advice, you're still taking bad advice, and so be it. But live with it and know it's all on you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bond. Suzanne Fury. Good evening, everyone. I'm Suzanne Fury, first grade teacher at Armstrong Elementary, SFT member. And I, of course, have not had my first day of school uh, because of the issues at our school, uh, the mold issues that actually have been there all summer. I've seen it all summer. I even have pictures to prove it, and it was quite appalling. And I would like to make a request that I would like to see the report of what was done at our school. I think as teachers, and for our safety and for our students' safety, I would like to see the air quality testing and what was done because I can tell you the mold was disgusting. And I want some kind of an assurance that we're not going to be dealing with this issue again, especially if the carpets were not tested and God knows what's under the carpets. But I, I'm very concerned about that because that's been a long-standing issue in our school. Uh, as a teacher, I'm thinking a little differently than perhaps uh, the first day of school. I'm thinking that we are minus 16 teachers. And yes, some of those have positions, but not the positions that they had, as Mrs. Bowen just said, doing something totally different. I am thinking about, over the past three years, what has happened, our, our reduction in our high school graduation requirements. And I know, I know I'm repeating but some of it, but it's so important. The reduction in the history and math requirements, the physical education requirements at the high school level changing, intermediate, this was talked about, no band, no instruments. 
these children will not get those opportunities out of school. The limited, the extremely limited exposure to the arts. Not everyone's going to be an engineer, an architect, a lawyer, a doctor. The arts are vital. The language programs, no summer reading, no hall monitors at the intermediate level. The preschool, shortening their day, taking away their art, music, physical education. And of course, the, the, the white elephant in the room, no library. I, I cannot fathom how we are starting the school year without one librarian or one open library. That is something that I will never, ever accept. It, it's so wrong, so wrong. Our early intervention teachers for our preschool that screen for speech and other difficulties, they are vital. They're federally funded programs. I don't even understand why that's been cut. In elementary, we're not going to have instruments. We're not going to have a course, a band. Fathom, just not fathomable. And the chaos of tomorrow. I can't, I'm not looking forward to tomorrow because we don't have that five minutes in between. So we're going to have four classes of students, hundreds of students in the hallway at the same time, going to lunch and coming back to lunch. We're going to have three lines in our hallway. I, I, I don't even want to think about that. I have to ask you to finish up, Suzanne. Well, what I will say is how many times did I just say the word no? We are taking, you're taking away from our students. It's, it's just appalling to me, and it doesn't, doesn't seem like it's going to stop. And I ask you to please reconsider what you're doing to our students. Thank you. Dr. Kieran, whatever the process would be, whether it be through uh, the principal at that building or the union officials, representatives for that building, could we just get that uh, result administered to that building so they have this peace of mind about returning back to work? Uh, Neil Armstrong. Oh, sure. I, is Mr. Brazil still here? There he is. Uh, Jeff, um, the air quality test that we did at Armstrong came back clean. It did. Uh, the school teachers would like to see that test. Can you get it over to the principal tomorrow? I can, but I'd rather, uh, I can provide it, but I'd also rather get the hard copy from Guzik Associates that actually describes it. I can give you the lab reports. That's fine. I don't know if uh, people know how to you, read them. but you have? I, I understand. I'll that. provide that, and then I'll also provide the uh, backup from uh, Guzik Associates. All right, thank you. First thank thing you. in the morning. Thank you, Mr. Brazil. Holly Mead. 